In this video, we'll look at the permutation group S4 and its lattice of subgroups. This group consists of the four factorial, i.e. 24, possible permutations of four objects. And although this might not be immediately obvious, it also happens to be isomorphic to the group of symmetries of the cube. To see why this is indeed the case, we could try to find a set of four geometric features of the cube that get permuted as we apply its various symmetry transformations. Ideally, we'd like every permutation of these features to be possible and to correspond to a unique symmetry transformation. As it turns out, the four long diagonals of the cube will give us just what we're looking for. Let's say the identity element in the cube's symmetry group corresponds to the arrangement shown, where the numbers on the front face appear in counterclockwise order starting from one at the top right corner. Now, as we start applying different symmetry transformations, notice that each transformation gives a different ordering of these numbers, i.e. of the diagonals. Going the other way around, we could use any permutation of the four numbers to specify a particular symmetry of the cube. So, using this visualization, we can define an isomorphism between these two, at first glance, seemingly unrelated groups. Now let's take a look at the subgroups of S4 and see how we can interpret them both combinatorially and as spatial transformations. We'll start with the cyclic groups of order 4, denoted here by C4. Here's one of them, consisting of four rotations in increments of 90 degrees about the y-axis. Another one does the same kinds of rotations, only about the x-axis. And yes, the third one is the set of four rotations about the z-axis. Combinatorially, each of these subgroups is generated by a four-cycle permutation of the diagonals. Going up the lattice, we can expand each of these C4s to a dihedral group of order 8 by throwing in the additional operation of flipping the axis about which we rotated. For example, Taking this cyclic group of four rotations about the z-axis, we get a d8 group by allowing ourselves the additional operation of flipping the cube upside down and combining that with any of the four existing rotations. Notice that this is just the group of symmetries of the square, which we saw in a previous video. Another useful way to think about this d8 group is that it consists of the eight symmetry transformations of the cube that map the z-axis to itself. In other words, these transformations either keep the z-axis fixed or flip it over so the negative part goes to the positive and vice versa. This definition will come in handy when we go to look at the Klein subgroups. As you might expect, the other two d8 subgroups are totally analogous to the one we just saw, with the role of the z-axis being played by the x or y-axis. Now let's take a look at the four Klein subgroups denoted in the lattice diagram by V, which comes from their German name Viergruppe. Note that one of them is kind of special in that it's a subgroup of all three D8 groups and of the alternating subgroup A4. By contrast, each of the other three Kleins is a subgroup of only one particular D8 and is not a subgroup of A4. Let's see if we can find this special Klein and identify what makes it different from the others. We'll temporarily squish the cube along the z-axis, just to recall what the Klein groups look like in the more familiar context of symmetries of a square. One of them was generated by a 180-degree rotation about the x-axis and a 180-degree rotation about the y-axis. As we saw in a previous video, combining these two operations is in fact equivalent to a 180-degree rotation about the z-axis. So, this Klein group consisted of all the 180-degree rotations about the coordinate axes, plus the identity operation. The other Klein subgroup of D8 had us doing 180-degree turns about the square's diagonals, like so. The combination of these two flips also produces a 180-degree rotation about the z-axis, 
which is the one non-trivial element this Klein group shares with the previous one. Of course, symmetries of the square are just a subset of symmetries of the cube. So, going back to our cube, the elements of the first Klein group look like this. Notice that each non-trivial element switches two pairs of diagonals at the same time, which means each of them performs an even number of transpositions. Hence, this group is a subgroup of the alternating group A4. Furthermore, since all elements in this Klein group map each of the three axes back to itself, it is a subgroup of all three D8s. Thus, we found our special Klein group. Now, notice that the cube has 12 edges, 4 parallel to the z-axis, 4 parallel to the y-axis, and 4 parallel to the x-axis. We can draw 6 lines connecting midpoints of opposite edges. For example, here are the two lines passing through midpoints of opposite vertical edges. Going back to the other Klein group we looked at, we might describe it as being generated by 180-degree turns about these two lines. Taken separately, each of these transformations interchanges only one pair of diagonals, and thus corresponds to an odd permutation. Hence, this Klein group cannot be a subgroup of any alternating group. Furthermore, while these transformations map the z-axis to itself, they interchange the other two axes. Therefore, this Klein is a subgroup of the d8 that maps the z-axis to itself, but not a subgroup of the other two d8s. Of course, these other d8s have Klein subgroups perfectly analogous to this one. Here, for example, is the one that always sends the x-axis to itself. Now let's take a quick look at the C2 subgroups. Each one of these groups contains only two elements and is generated by a single 180-degree turn about some particular axis. In the three groups on the left of the diagram, the axis of rotation is just one of our coordinate axes. As we have seen, these rotations, which are the non-trivial elements of our special Klein group, swap two pairs of diagonals simultaneously, producing an even permutation. Thus, the C2 groups they generate are subgroups of the alternating group A4. Each one of them is also a subgroup of one of the other three Klein groups, as well as of a particular C4 and D8. In the C2 groups on the right, the axis of rotation is one of the lines connecting opposite edges of the cube. Since these rotations interchange only one pair of diagonals, the groups they generate cannot belong to any alternating group. As shown earlier, taking two such rotations lets us generate a Klein group. However, to do so, we must be careful to select a pair such that the two axes connect parallel sets of edges. For example, these two lines, which connect pairs of vertical edges. Note that these two rotations produce disjoint two cycles. But what if we were to take a mismatched pair, say a rotation about this line and a rotation about this line? These rotations correspond to a pair of two cycles that are not disjoint. Let's try combining them repeatedly and see what happens. Watch how the dots get permuted. What we have just done is use a sequence of transpositions, i.e. two cycles, to generate a group of order 6, specifically a dihedral group D6, which is isomorphic to the symmetric group S3. Combinatorially, this group is a set of all permutations of three objects. In our particular case, these three objects were the diagonals numbered 2, 3, and 4, while the first diagonal remained fixed. Geometrically, we often think of this group as the group of symmetries of an equilateral triangle, and if we look at the cube from a certain perspective, we can really see this threefold structure. Here we have a 120 degree rotation about the red diagonal, which generates one of our C3 groups. Combining this with a 180 degree rotation that flips the red diagonal around, we can generate the entire D6 group. Here is what its elements look like when we return to our original point of view.
Note that we first generated this group by 180 degree rotations about two different axes, combinatorially by two cycle permutations. Now we've seen that we can also generate it by a combination of 120 and 180 degree rotations. In other words, a three cycle and a two cycle. This illustrates the fact that in almost all cases, there is more than one way to generate a group. Since we have four diagonals, we have four of these C3 subgroups and four corresponding D6 groups, each consisting of transformations that send a particular diagonal back to itself and permute the three others. Here is the D6 that fixes the second diagonal. And here is the one that fixes the third. And here is the last one that fixes the fourth. Last but not least, let's take a look at the alternating group A4. This group consists of all even permutations of four objects. The smallest non-trivial even permutation is a three cycle. Just as any symmetric group can be generated by two cycles, any alternating group can be generated by three cycles. In our case, these correspond to 120 degree rotations about the diagonals. So, we can think of A4 as the set of all transformations we can create by combining these rotations, or combinatorially three-cycle permutations on a set of four objects. There is also another way to interpret this group geometrically. As we saw in another video, the group of symmetries of the tetrahedron is isomorphic to A4. We can inscribe a tetrahedron inside our cube like this. The 12 symmetries of the cube belonging to A4 are simply those that map the tetrahedron back to itself, such as these ones. Now that we have seen all the subgroups of S4, it may be worthwhile to pause and note how remarkable it is that we can interpret these groups in such different ways. On the one hand, we can think of them combinatorially as consisting of sets of permutations of four dots. On the other hand, we can see these groups as sets of transformations of a three-dimensional space. It is interesting that by observing how permutations combine to form other permutations, we can learn about how spatial transformations combine to form other spatial transformations, and vice versa. In the next video, we'll take yet another look at S4 by examining the matrices that describe these 3D transformations.